to episode 17 of the Data Driven Strength Podcast. Um, I'm here with Zach and Jake. We have a couple questions lined up today. Um, so we're going to go ahead and dive right into it. Um, we'll be talking about one question kind of related to, to volume allocation. We're going to talk about a question asking about top singles or top sets. And, um, you know, we're going to kind of discuss shifting loading demands and, and some programming considerations there. And then the last question we'll wrap up with is going to be related to a topic we've all been kind of thinking about lately, which is perception of effort and how that's kind of influenced by rest period. So that's what you have to look forward to. We'll go ahead and kick it off with this first question related to volume allocation. Um, So the question is, within the context of powerlifting training, how would you account for volume in an isolation exercise such as a leg extension? Considering that it isn't a squat variation, would counting hard sets not be a useful metric in this instance? Um, so Zach, Jake, whoever wants to take a crack at that, that, uh, that question, we can get the ball rolling. So I think this is a really good question for a few reasons. Obviously the, the utility of tracking hard sets is something that's gained a lot of favor, uh, recently. And, and that's for a good reason, obviously it's a really simple and, you know, has been shown in the research also to be relatively predictive of like hypertrophy or, or strength outcomes. Um, but I do think this question hinges on something that's pretty important and it's the difference of essentially what counts uh, as a hard set um, and, and are, is that equivalent between exercises? And I would say it definitely is not. And, uh, you know, this kind of leads to a tangential conversation kind of that you talked about in the intro, Josh, is like, how does this kind of problem in, in equating volume between exercises, how does that influence our decision making in terms of how we would shift training volume between exercises or, or kind of slot types? Um, th- throughout a training cycle. And I think this is one of the really practical considerations to make when you're, when you're kind of doing that, because, you know, let's say, uh, you know, something we've talked about before, um, I think Jake made a post about it recently, actually, is like um, in a hypertrophy phase, maybe you're going to do more of your volume on hypertrophy oriented slots, like, you know, hack squat, like extension, things like that. And then a in, a in a strength block, maybe you would transfer some of that volume over to, you know, your more specific variants, competition squat, pause squat, things like that. On paper, super makes perfect sense. Obviously we want to have, you know, put as many eggs in our basket in terms of hypertrophy as we can during the hypertrophy phase while also having kind of like a maintenance or minimum effective dose in the strength uh, department. And then in the strength phase, we'd kind of want to flip that. Um, but I think this is one of the examples that's difficult and, you know, a concept we talk about all the time is how important it is to find an individual's training dose that they respond to. And when you're starting to move around volume from different exercises, I think that starts to blur the lines a ton. And it makes it makes maintaining and, and uh, having an adequate training dose for an individual a little bit more complicated because if I'm moving uh, sets from, from those a little bit more um, maybe uh, favorable stimulus to fatigue ratio uh, to something that's a little bit more specific and anecdotally is a little bit more fatiguing, then the, the, the amount of volume an individual needs to progress gets a little bit more uh, foggy in my experience. So I think that's um, one thing to, to consider. So I think, um, you know, to answer the question simply, I think definitely, I don't think a set on a leg extension is equal to a set on a squat. How do you mathematically equate those? I don't think we have a good idea, but to me, that is an, is probably an argument in favor from a practical perspective to kind of manipulate sets within exercises because uh, it's just going to be very difficult to, to essentially guess what is, the, what is the amount that I'm going to need to trade to different exercises to nail the training dose for an individual, especially when we're going into a competition. Now, obviously, um, you know, if you're working with an individual for a long time, you might be able to have a better feel for kind of, you know, how many of uh, these leg, leg extension sets should I transfer over into squats. But I think the same problem kind of exists long term, but I'll go ahead and toss it to you guys before I throw some other things out. I, I can jump in there. I think that um, one, I go back and forth on this because I, I think I think that I'm more in favor of changing the allocation, maybe more so than than you are, at least based on what you just said. Um, and I don't think either one is right or wrong, right? It's just it's a debate, bro. It's a debate. I uh, I will fully acknowledge that it definitely makes it's another variable that you're throwing into the mix, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that reducing the, the moving parts is really good, but at the same time, like, I, I feel like the the idea that it makes it harder to find the ideal training dose would then assume that like everything else is sort of the same. Mm-hmm. Like, 
So I don't know. Um, and to me, this is where I find the most benefit from doing, from ramping up volume across a mesocycle in a hypertrophy phase at least, that it gives you more wiggle room to find that dose and you don't have to nail it on week one or week two, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so I, I think that's a way that we can kind of get around that the way that in, in the sense that it's harder to find that right dose is if we just have more room to kind of experiment and find it along the way. And then like you're saying, the more blocks you have with an athlete, like you start to get a really good idea. Right. Um, and I don't, there's no perfect way to track it, right? Like there's no two sets of leg extensions is equal to one set of squat. Like there's just nothing mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Um, the best that I've been able to come up with so far is, is honestly just taking notes and, and just thinking through like, okay, in this block, they were doing this much of this, this much of that. They felt extra fatigued and less practiced and all that, you know what I mean? It's like just trying to be conscious of everything that's going on and just have a lot more like informal data in the sense of it's not like a number on a, sh on a graph or whatever and using that to help make decisions. Yeah. I think just to plug in a few things, kind of, like you said, Jake, well, from what I said, you might think that I'm the type of person that's going to have a ton of, you know, competition with volume in all the time. And I don't think that could be further from the case. Actually, I think what, what I'm kind of shifting towards, at least mentally now, first of all, I want to say, Jake, I definitely do it that way sometimes. So it's not like a either or thing, just like, just like we said, it's pretty contextual. And I definitely shift volume allocation occasionally. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that um, I think it kind of goes both ways in the sense that I have rarely had success with jacking up the competition lift volume in a strength phase. Like to me, that's where I start is like saying, okay, is going from, you know, three or four sets of three in a maybe hypertrophy phase for like maintenance of skill practice, three to three to five reps, something like that. And going to seven sets of three in a strength phase, does that often lead to considerably more, you know, perception of practice? I don't know. In my experience, not really. And often that's where the kind of the nicks and the niggles start to flare up. If you really just start to overload, um, you know, a ton of work on those lifts. So to me, I kind of work backwards from there. It's like, okay, what is the minimum effective dose or maybe slightly more than that? This person needs to kind of progress their technique or improve their skill practice. That's what I'm starting with in the hypertrophy phase. And often that's going to reflect a, in comparison to normal programs, that's probably going to be a more, um, shifted volume profile to those hypertrophy variants than most people. So I still think that um, that's kind of where I'm going from. And then you would just take that kind of that distribution of volume and then you would just keep that pretty similar. So you're going from, you know, maybe three sets of five and hypertrophy phase on like a comp squat. And then you would maybe go to like, I don't know, four or five sets of three or something like that and kind of the low fatigue style or whatever. So it's going to be very, very similar. It's not like you're going from, you know, six sets of five on comp squat and hypertrophy phase to, you know, whatever, uh, something crazy in the strength phase. I think that's, that's kind of my thing. Cause I, so I agree with you in general is that we want to have that, um, kind of configuration of training that we can really find that dose. And it's not so, so particular when we have these super high fatigue variants and an additional set of squats is exponentially greater than an additional set of leg extensions or something like that. So, um, I think I'm kind of in the middle there and I, I definitely use both approaches, but, um, that's kind of, kind of the way I think about it, but gosh, I don't know. You've been sitting there when you got, Jake, Jake, go for it. Looks like you have something to say. I was just going to throw to respond one. directly. Yeah, I was just going to throw one thing in that, like, just to be clear, like, I don't do that either, right? Like, I'm not going from one set to seven sets. Like, that would we be dumb. Have, we have no approach. But, we don't do it. <laughs> we uh, we're just guessing with yep. literally every single training block. Um, no, but I think um, I agree with you that going, like, going from a low amount of the more specific lifts to a really high amount is not a good idea, right? So, that's another good instance where like deload intro week and then the thing gives you a more fluid transition, which I think can, can help with that. Um, and then I think the, the, the last thing that I'll say is that I, when we talk about defining the, the ideal training dose, it's like, I don't want that to come off as like your training dose for, dose for squats is exactly this. Right. And that's like all you'll make progress with, right? For like sure. it's a, there's a band there. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have a little bit more wiggle room and, and obviously we still want to try to find it as well as we can, but um, I just don't want people to feel crippled by like, I have to find it exactly and never change. Eight sets, bro. That's what I, that's what I do well on. 
I think one one more thing to chime in. Yeah, that's one more thing to chime in with just so I don't forget it. The other thing too is like I think we have talked a ton about how um, you know, there's probably more hypertrophy friendly exercises. The one thing I always like to counter myself on stuff like that is is like the, the competition lifts aren't bad for hypertrophy. And I think it's just important to keep that in mind is like, you know, you don't have to take them completely out like they're worthless. And especially if you, you know, execute them in a, an appropriate manner, aren't like dive bomb and squats and, you know, controlling eccentrics and all that good stuff. Um, and then also the, the kind of the consideration that for every kind of amount of hypertrophy that you get, it might be a little bit more specific too. So it's like, I still think there's a, there's an argument for, for not completely disregarding the hypertrophic abilities of those lifts too, but this has gone way farther in the weeds than I expected. Josh bring us back and, and maybe wrap it up. Yeah. So listening to you guys discuss this, is basically just the two sides that my mind concurrently takes. Um, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a correct answer here. And I don't think either of you guys are claiming that. Um, to directly kind of address the question and just provide a kind of a take home point. Um, so the question asked, like, you know, how would you account for volume or like, is counting hard sets a useful metric? I think what this question kind of implies is that you need, like, you need to know, ex you have to put a number on it. And I think there's an inherent flaw in that, in that line of thinking, because this is kind of quantifying the training stimulus is kind of an art, right? If you, it, yes, counting hard sets is awesome, right? It's easy. Um, it has pretty high predictive abilities, right? In, in terms of predicting outcomes. Um, but especially when strength is one of your goals, um, it, it, it can get tricky, right? We've talked about relative volume being a nice tool. Sets is of course useful, but again, I would just really emphasize that it's kind of in art and we've been unable to put a perfect number on it that applies in all scenarios. So that's something that I'd really, I'd really point out. Um, so I definitely wouldn't say it's not useful of counting hard sets. I wouldn't say it's perfect. It's just, it kind of is what it is. And there's a bit of an art to it. Um, next to get into the specific discussion about volume allocation between, you know, more of your strength focused work and kind of your hypertrophy focused work and whether that should shift depending on where you are in the training cycle. Um, Zach and I, Zach and I fought over this <laughs> for, for multiple days when we were, kind of writing the framework for our individualized programming product. Um, I took the stance of, Hey, we should shift the volume allocation so that, you know, as you get closer to the, to the, the peak at the end of the training cycle, um, you're going to be doing more work specific to the main lifts. Um, and Zach said, no, let's keep it constant. Zach ultimately won out and actually, I've, I've kind of been leaning that way more lately. So with my, with my one-on-one -on -one clients, I've actually been keeping it steady and I've personally found it helpful from a diagnostic perspective in terms of actually telling what changes cycle to cycle helped. Um, again, that's not to say that shifting the volume allocation is bad by any means. I think there's definitely a time and a place for that. Um, Especially psychologically. Just, yeah. I personally just... I've personally just just found it helpful uh, again from a from a diagnostic perspective, and like like you said, I think kind of the the approach I I've been taking lately is if we're not doing enough work on the main lifts in the hypertrophy phase to get better at them, we should probably be doing more anyway. And then you get to the strength phase, you're like, we don't really need to do more. We're already doing enough. Um, there's kind of diminishing returns. And like you said, those, the main lifts are still decent for hypertrophy. Um, and I just think that that volume allocation between the two is one of the primary things we like to individualize. And I've personally found again, from like more of a, a, a diagnostic pers perspective that um, kind of finding what that is for the individual and hanging out there has been really helpful. So again, there's no right or wrong answer. I have kind of been leaning more towards keeping it steady though lately. The last point I want to make is, yeah, go for it, Jake. You're fine. If you got another point, you don't, and I can. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Something that Jake said earlier is that your training dose isn't like a single thing, right? Even if we could quantify it, it's not like 
you know, you are training dose 63, I'm training dose 47, right? Like there, it, it doesn't work like that. And I think another thing to point out is that um, you're not at that training dose the whole cycle, at least the way that we do it. We'll, we'll kind of ramp people up over the, the first couple of weeks of the training cycle, um, deload. If, if you're doing multiple blocks, deload, ramp back up, and then typically finish with a taper. So, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that there's kind of a range of training dose and to circle back to the original question, it is kind of an art and you're, you're like that first week of the training cycle from a relative perspective, it actually might be like, you're not adapted to the training stimulus of the training cycle yet. Right. So from a relative perspective, the training stress is going to be higher in week one compared to week three, even though the apple, uh, the absolute training stress is going to be lower, or, or I shouldn't say the relative stress would be higher. It just, the relative stress compared to the absolute stress basically is what it comes down to. So point being is there's always a give and a take based on like how adapted you are to the, to the given training stimulus that, that you're, uh, you're being presented with. So anyway, Jack, Jake, I'll, I'll pa pass it over to you. The only thing that I wanted to add was just to underscore the psychological element that Zach brought up. And it seems like, um, I think a lot of people, but it, at least especially a lot of people that, that I'm working with is like the, the power lifter who also really, really cares about hypertrophy. And I think that if you're the, 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 the training that we might do for somebody who's only interested in strength to somebody who isn't that way emotionally, it can seem really like sterile and just like not that fun and interesting. So like, yes, it does decrease the, the noise that's going on. It makes it easier to figure out exactly what's up. But the trade-off with that, right, I think is worth it for a lot of people just in the sense of keeping things more enjoyable and fun. 100%. That's, that's the only thing that I wanted to throw in there. 100%. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, in that application. And that's always kind of my Achilles heel. When 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 Jake brings something up, I'm almost always in like strength, like generally is kind of the way I, I view it. And Jake, you know, has a little bit more of a bodybuilding hypertrophy background. So it's like that's the slight difference in perspective can ultimately um, influence the way that you're implementing these things a lot of times. But I, I've had a ton of instances where I've done a very similar thing. I think we've talked about before kind of like, you know, if you had to say like a stock training cycle that we generally give somebody it's probably like a hypertrophy block followed by a strength block taper test kind of deal but often especially when you have people that you know the waxes and wanes of typical training motivation i had some will sometimes throw in an additional hypertrophy block to proceed kind of the normal training cycle in which i'll do a ton of the things that you just mentioned jake where you know the exercise variation is you know a wider array um put in some movements that you know aren't super specific to strength chest flies you know, leg extensions, that kind of thing. And it, it literally is the exact same thing um, in, in function, which, so yeah, I think we're on the exact same page, but I'll, uh, I'll cut us off there and, and web us over to the next question. I'll let Josh uh, take this one first. So Josh, the second question here, it says uh, for powerlifters and those who are aiming to hit top singles, do you think staying away from RPEs of eight and higher reduces a lifter's ability to perform maximal effort singles. So uh, the, the presumption there is like 10 RP grinders. Um, for example, grinding on a really tough attempt is exactly what they said. So um, do you think that staying away from those high exertion RP singles uh, reduces a lifter's ability to perform, uh, you know, maximally on the platform, Josh? This is a, this is a really good question. And I think I think this kind of align. I think my answer aligns with just my general thought process about specificity and how you, you know, what is theoretically optimal in terms of specificity, but then you kind of have to work down the ladder and say, okay, this is training. Um, and we need to figure out how to get to, to the, the, the desired goal as efficiently as possible. So if we just think about specificity in general, if, if the goal is a, a single at 10, we should be doing singles at 10 every single session. Um, and that's probably going to really allow you to grind out heavy singles and, and improve your ability to do so. Um, but if you're always doing singles at 10, that's of course gonna come at a cost. So I would literally just frame my answer to this question as a cost benefit analysis. It's always a give and a take. So for some people, you can give singles at RP8 
all the time. And that's going to drastically improve their ability to um, grind out heavy attempts. And it also might not have as big of a cost in terms of fatigue, whether that be psychological or physiological. Um, other individuals might be kind of flipped, right? You, you might not really get a huge benefit in terms of skill practice from those. And they also might come at a, a greater fatigue cost. So there's always going to be a different uh, like benefit for each individual. And there's always going to be a, a different cost for each individual when you give them a certain prescription. So again, it, it really just comes down to tolerance and how much it seems to benefit that individual. Um, so to directly answer the question, I think doing heavy top sets in the one to three range around RP seven to eight quite often is a great idea. Um, it's going to, that's going to help some people more than others. It's also going to beat up some people more than others. And I think the answer to those questions is going to inform your programming decisions. The only, I think that's great. I agree with that. I agree with everything that you said. Um, I do think though, that if you're never going above an RPE eight, when you get on the platform, you're going to be terrified to do a true rpe 10 like grinder For lift sure. right so just in the sense of um having the confidence to do that um to be able to get under the like if it's a squat and you've never gone above an rpe 8 the i mean i mean maybe it's just me but i think a lot of people just the anxiety with that is crazy and that can really affect your performance and like you just can't really tap into that last little bit to drive it up right so i think again purely from a psychological perspective, I do think it's helpful to at least occasionally get up and grind something out. Now, I'm not saying to do 1RM all the time. You know what I mean? It's, we want to be really careful and can just kind of thread it in where appropriate and make sure that, like you said, Josh, there's a trade-off for everything, right? That comes with a lot more fatigue costs and all this kind of stuff. So uh, being smart with it, but I, I do think it's good to, when you get on the platform, to be able to think back to a moment when like, okay, I've already done this before, right? Like my body knows how to handle this. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Jake. I think there's definitely a, a time and place in, in which that kind of stuff can have um, advantages. Like the way that I've kind of viewed this question is I kind of broke it down into three areas of like, okay, so like neuromuscularly, like from an adaptation perspective, is a single at a nine and a half, 10, that much different from a single at an eight? You could maybe make an argument that it is, but I don't think that, that is going to outweigh the exponentially greater fatigue cost that's going to come from one of those, especially if you have a large changing in, in the joint angles at those maximum weights. What I mean by that, I don't think that's bad inherently, but I'm just thinking of myself in a squat, for example. Like if I work up to a single at a nine, nine and a half, then when I haven't in a while, if I have some upper back flexion or something like that, that I generally don't have when I squat, because I'm not accustomed to that, I am just, my back is wrecked for like a week and a half after that. So I don't think that's necessarily a disadvantage of, of those, but it's a disadvantage of those when you're not accustomed to it. So I think that you could make an argument that if you slowly ramped up to those and, and had them in right relatively frequently, maybe you could adapt to those uh, kind of changes and shifts of load and demands over time. But in general, I would be relatively skeptical that like a single out of nine to 10 is going to give a significantly greater like adaptation or whatever that we're looking for from those top sets uh, in comparison to something like a seven to eight, like Josh said, that's in general. Now, the other two aspects I had was the one that Jake just hit on is confidence. That to me is like, that's a really big one. So I think having prior experience to what max weights feel like, I think alleviates the need to to have that a little bit. So like if you're an experienced powerlifter who competes relatively frequently um, and you know what those, you know, grant, you, you essentially go into the attempt knowing what to expect. I think that's going to decrease the need to have to include um, very, very high exertion singles as often. Um, but for somebody that doesn't know what that feels like, obviously, like you said, Jake, you're going to be shaking in your boots, working up, going up there for your third attempt where you have never really felt what a true RB 10 single is. So I think that's something to consider too, is like, whatever the situation is, that lifter needs to have confidence under those loads. And that's going to dictate how frequently they have to be exposed to that. I also think you could get that potentially from maybe a little bit less, um, I don't, I don't know what injurious is the right way, but maybe a little bit less, um, 
the cost benefit analysis is a little bit higher. So maybe that's when you do have an advantage of those slightly higher rep repetition sets where you take them to an RP9, like a set of three at nine, four at nine, five at nine, something like that. You could, you know, have a similar situation um, happen and that you could get some confidence from that without having to work up to, you know, a true single at 10 where anecdotally at least some bad things can happen if things go slightly wrong. Um, and, I, and yeah, I think that just, especially psychologically too, it's not a weight that you're emotionally tied to as often. Like you're, you know, you do your four RM or whatever. It's like, yeah, maybe you have a PR that you're thinking about, but it's not nearly as ingrained as your head as a one RM is. And then the last thing I had was just um, from a technical aspect, I think this is going to be super, super individual. So this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently is just how I have some clients that for whatever reason, repetition seems to be how they improve technically even though on paper that doesn't seem to be as specific as like a very heavy single would be. And that's like how you would think they would improve technique, um, you know, in a specific manner. But for whatever reason, some individuals in my experience just really respond very well to an increased amount of repetitions in which maybe a lower exertion single, just to use it from the diagnostic perspective, but also to set kind of your, your strength through the day, maybe that's the function of the single instead of um, kind of the sport specificity uh, in, in that case, and maybe you do opt for like a set of four or five and nine or something like that for that individual to get that exertion practice. Just another thing I thought of, but um, Josh, I don't have anything to add there. Yeah. So when you were talking, I think those are all great points. It reminded me of a, kind of a relevant thing I often do um, is if I suspect that I have an athlete in which they are either not confident or they just don't have the skill to kind of grind through, you know, singles at RP nine and a half or 10, instead of opting for, okay, let's throw singles at nine and a half to 10 at them during this training cycle. What I'll do is I will try to accomplish that at the lowest cost. So typically what I'll do is I will, um, I will prescribe a very like a load limiting variation and like as load limiting as I can make it. So I'll do like a beltless two count pause deadlift and I'll push those to like, Hey, I want you to hit a triple at RP nine to 10 um, this week, for example. And I, by doing a triple, it's still heavy enough. And you're getting that, you know, that last rep, the, the, the loading demands are definitely going to be shifting. Um, you're going to be practicing grinding through a rep. And I find that um, very helpful in terms of um, just that grind practice without having to push um, singles at nine and a half to 10 on the main lift, which can be a bit more fatiguing in my experience. So again, um, individual results will vary, but I found that that quite helpful for, for particular athletes. It's totally off the wall, but something I thought about um, as you guys were talking about this question. Do you think this is a potential use case for isometrics at relevant joint angles? I've always thought about that. Um, you know, if we if we load up a bar in a position that would mimic uh, whatever is relevant to the given lift, an isometric would allow us to produce force to a similar degree as a as a maximal attempt, um, so long as the joint angle is appropriate. Um, but without you know with a very, very minimal fatigue cost in comparison to like a true RP 10 uh, squat or deadlift, um, for example. Now, again, that's not going to be exactly the same, but from a neuromuscular perspective, I don't know. I, I think you could make an argument that that could be somewhat useful um, and would cause probably a fraction of like the muscle damage and stuff like that um, because of the, uh, the lack of muscle action. But I'm curious what you guys think of just something I thought of my my knee jerk reaction is that there's going to be a ton of practical consideration or practical limitations that are going to render it way less effective than it might be hypothetically so if we think about the difference in joint angles between for some individuals a single at 7 compared to a single at 10 it's really not going to be that much right just from an absolute perspective but you know, from a practical perspective, it's enough, like you said, for somebody like you, Zach, for your upper back to be wrecked for a week and a half because mm -hmm. you haven't been exposed to that. Um, so would we really have the precision to do that in an isometric sense 
to get that single at 10 joint angle compared to that single at nine, jo uh, that single at seven joint angle. And also, um, so you said a potential benefit is that you're not having the actual dynamic contraction that would be more likely to, to induce muscle damage. And, and that one might way. Actually... Yeah. In one way, in another way, that's a disadvantage right. because it's not as specific. Right. Obviously. So that's yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say is that might actually be what you're trying to train. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's just kind of my initial thoughts, but I, I like the idea. Definitely something I, I think we should think about more. My knee jerk reaction is that there's, there are definitely some limitations, but I think, I think there, but I, I, on the other hand, there it's, such, it's probably so low cost, right? Is, isometrics. Right. You know, you exactly. Can, That's the idea. Such it's so low cost that it, that it might be worth it. What you got, cool. Jake? That makes sense to me. I don't, uh, the isometric stuff is, is interesting. I, I think, at least for me personally, I have a hard time with it in the sense that, like, unless it's really powerful, like, I'm just not going to do it. Mm. <laughs> Either way, it's just, like... So, there's certain so, things so here here's a i'm sorry to cut you off but i'm just i'm just curious because this is kind of the way i think about it like okay we, we had a conversation the other day where we talked about like how you know sometimes when training motivation isn't as high how much it sucks to work up to a top single on squat or deadlift right let's say you could warm up to a relatively equivalent effort on squat or deadlift in you know 10 15 minutes regardless of how strong you are because you can just put in maximal effort into the pins at the relevant joint. Like that to me is the benefit. Like if there is a neuromuscular, you know, thing that's pretty similar to what we're trying to improve, but for whatever reason, you don't want to, you know, make, make the time investment to work up to a, you know, 600 pound single, for example, for really strong people on, on a squat or deadlift, like if you could permit a similar amount of force while saving a ton of time to do so, um, and potentially fatigue as well. And then maybe we can put a little bit more effort into our volume work. I'm painting a really, really positive picture for isometrics here. To be clear, zero evidence about this. This is just totally just me spitballing on the moment. Um, but yeah, no, I just, uh, I don't know. I think you can make a case for it in terms of kind of that kind of thing. Like if, you know, strength is specific um, in all those ways. And one of those ways is contraction type. So like you're, you're taking a loss in, in that regard. But if it's enough of a benefit, that we could do that relatively frequently at a low cost and in time, time cost as well. I think that could be a use case, but again, I'm, I'm being pretty optimistic here. I don't know if that's uh, the best um, case when we have pretty limited evidence on this, as far as I'm aware, but, um, but yeah. I think, I think we're going to have to think through this more, but I think there's something with isometrics. There, there has to be something with isometrics that would be useful for a strength athlete. Um, I think we often you like part of the utility of top sets is kind of gauging your your strength for the day and and kind of auto regulating load for the day. Um, perhaps we could bypass that um, and low cost, like lower lower fatigue cost, lower time cost, and gauge force output for the day. Now we'd probably want to see something um, looking at correlations between dynamic 1RM strength and this isometric test and have a bunch of subjects come in on uh, on different days and, and look at how how tight that relationship is and if it is indeed tight then that might be something that's that's useful in practice now <laughs> right now I'm not aware of any good tools for the practitioner I've heard of something called force hooks um, that is but I believe it's like a couple grand so Anybody wants to make what's that? Brain scale. Yeah. So we got to figure out the tools as well. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, any other any other thoughts on the loading demands or should we shift pun intended to perception of effort? I, I think we should go to perception of effort. Cool. All right. So this last question is if your rest time on high RPE sets is three minutes, how are low RPE sets? So volume equated, as you've described. So basically, okay, we're, we're taking a given amount of volume um, and we're doing more sets, but this, each set is at a lower RP, but the rest time is lower, okay? Um, I'd obviously feel ready sooner because the set was less fatiguing, 
but does this compensate for lower efficiency somewhat or do short or do shorter rest times decrease velocity enough as to invalidate the premise? So let me kind of synthesize that and make sure everybody's on the same page. So basically we have a given amount of, of work, let's say a given number of repetitions at a given percentage of one RM. And let's try to equate for the time. Um, in one case, we're gonna do less reps per set, lower RPE per set, but less rest periods. Another case, we're gonna do more reps per set, higher RPE, but longer rest periods. So the question is, will the lower RPE approach with shorter rests, would that actually lead to um, like lower fatigue overall? Or would it um, kind of be a wash because you do have the, the downside there in the sense that there are lower rest periods. So uh, Jake, Zach, whoever wants to kick, kick that off. Go for it, Jake, you found the paper. Um, yeah, okay, so to be clear, I have not read the full text of this paper. <laughs> So putting that out as a caveat, but it came out today. <laughs> it, it, yeah. So um, there was a new paper that came out and I, I'm going to butcher the author's last name. Uh, Picaras San Chis? San Chis? I don't know. Something like that. Um, it's not Sanchez because it's I-Z. I took three years of honor Spanish, so I should know how to pronounce that, but I don't. Nevertheless, the <laughs> Basically, the study is, is looking at some things that were really relevant to this question. Um, it's very difficult to keep a straight face and talk about this with these laughing, but here we go. So train people. Um, you said, Josh, you looked at the one RM, right? It was like 100, 100 kilo squat or something like that was the yeah, average like one 106, RM. 106. Um, yeah. So, I mean, not super strong, but I mean, trained in terms of like the literature that we have. Um, and they did basically what we're talking about here, right? Three sets of eight with five minutes of rest or six sets of four with two minutes of rest. Um, and they tested a bunch of different, this is with 75% 1RM, by the way. And they tested a bunch of stuff, counter movement jump, um, MBIC, force output, velocity, power, et cetera. And essentially what they found is the group that did six sets of four, so the lower RPE sets with less rest in between had better like mechanical variables, right? Better force output, better velocity, power. Um, whereas the group that went with the three sets of eight and the longer rest periods, they had um, the, they had lesser, where am I at? Lesser force output, lesser velocity, lesser power, higher fatigue markers, things like that, right? So that study, again, if it is very high quality, and I haven't read the entire full text, to be clear, but, um, if that all checks out, then that would be some evidence to say that, like, even if you're using shorter rest periods like this, like, you're probably fine. Um, and I think anecdotally that makes sense, right? Because if, if we're equating load between these two different conditions and we have less, uh, a lower RPE in that set and you feel more recovered and you can hit that set again and it feels like a really similar RPE, your velocity is probably not slowed down that much, right? Like, um, cause that's sort of the goal is where we're trying to keep the RPE really low. If you're going with such short rest times that your RPE is climbing, you should probably rest a little bit longer, right? So that would be my two senses. I, I think that um, you feel recovered so you can do the set again. If your performance is very similar set to set, you're probably recovered just fine and not really sacrificing anything in terms of force output. Yeah, so to be clear for the listener, we kind of, we had this question set up before we discussed this paper and then right before we hit record. Um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody was like, hey, did you guys see that new paper? And we're like, oh, wait, that's interesting for this, um, for this last question. So, you know, I think, I think even, you know, without this paper, but I do, I do have it pulled up right here in the figure, uh, you know, it's figure 2a in the in the full text provides a really nice visual representation of this but basically what it comes down to is i think for a lot of individuals you can have equated time and less reps per set and still have a higher um like average force output right even at the even at a given load is that going to apply for all individuals i'm not sure it's probably going to depend on on, on cardiorespiratory fitness to some degree um but 
in our experience, basically everybody can do that. It is kind of a different kind of difficulty to really stay focused and say, I'm going to take a 90 second rest here so that my session doesn't turn into this, this marathon. Um, so point being is at the end of the day, if we are going to break up a given number of reps at a given percentage of one RM with lower RPE per set, um, the goal is to have higher force output, you know, kind of, you can think of like force output area under the curve, if you will, for that protocol based on this study, based on our experience, that is the case. And the reason I can say kind of based on our experience is because if you also look at the figure from this paper, um, so they reported like the individual average force for each rep for each group, as well as the individual average velocity for each, um, for each rep for each group. And they're, they like totally align, right? So if a repetition is higher velocity, um, it's going to be a higher force output, right? And we have access to uh, velocity trackers. So um, point being is you can, for a lot of people, you can take a given amount of work and um, even though there is decreased rest periods, which isn't ideal from a force output standpoint, it's still going to be a net a net positive in the end from a force output perspective. Um, so again, I just want to emphasize that it, it, it is pretty tough to train this way, um, even though the average RPE might be two, three points lower, the session RPE might be similar. Um, so I think that's something to, to keep in mind, just kind of based on our experience. So um, yeah, Zach, what do you think, man? Yeah, no, I think that's pretty intuitive. Um, even just like doing this, doing this yourself, I think um, you notice that even if you're taking shorter, especially on the bench press is like one that I think immediately comes to mind is like you might be taking, I don't know, three, four, five minutes, typically between higher exertion sets. But if you cut that down to like a protocol similar to this, you can take considerably less than that. And I think um, maintain performance, which ultimately is what we think is going to lead to the theoretical benefit uh, of this. So, um, so yeah, I think that, that, uh, that makes sense. And I don't have too much to add. I, the one thing, I, one of the reasons I picked out this question is I kind of wanted to pivot this into just a general discussion on rest periods and perception of effort. So Josh, you recently did, um, uh, a webinar for this um, for the individualized programming product that um, that we have, um, and that generated some really interesting discussion. I thought um, kind of around this topic and how that relates to gains in uh, muscle mass and strength, and kind of the typical landscape of the rest period discussion is that you know we have this conflicting research saying that in general longer rest periods seem to be better, especially for muscle growth. Um, in, in kind of your standard design when you're looking at rest periods. However, we have this kind of tangential area of research that looks at, you know, special intensity techniques like my reps or rest pause, whichever you prefer, and, and like drop sets that obviously take extremely short rest periods and artificially harm performance. And that sometimes actually leads to better muscle growth. So it's like you have this kind of paradox between very long rest periods seeming to lead to better muscle growth than like one or two minute rest periods versus, you know, traditional rest periods, like two or three minutes versus these kind of intensity techniques that also lead to better muscle growth. How can those both be true? Um, and, and it was kind of something we, we started to talk about in terms of um, perception of effort and, and stuff like that. So I don't know if you kind of want to kick off that conversation and kind of kick it around a little bit. Yeah. So just, just to be clear, um, my understanding of looking at like the intensity techniques. Now, I, my scope, the scope of my reading for this was primarily around drop sets and any sort of like rest pause type training. Um, and I didn't find anything. Well, okay, I actually eat my words. I was going, I was going to say that none of the intensity techniques were better, but there is a study by Prestes and colleagues that did find better hypertrophy for kind of a rest pause group. But the other group, I think it was like four sets of six at 80%, but there was no note of whether load was progressed for the group that um, was just training that four by six. Whereas the, the group doing the rest pause training, uh, I believe they took their sets to volitional failure, like that first set, as well as the, um, the cluster sets that they did after. So honestly, I'm not super convinced. I wouldn't take that evidence and say that, hey, cluster sets are better because um, there was 
no progression that I'm aware of in the Presti study. But as far as I'm aware, that's the only study finding better um, better muscle growth for something like uh, rest pause or drop sets. So let's say that is the case. So that, that very well may be the case. It's been a while since I read the Presti study. I still think the point would still stand that theoretically based on our model of rest periods that longer rests are better. That shouldn't be as good. Is that, would, would you agree with that? Potentially. It just, it's so hard because uh, maybe. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I don't agree with that, yeah, but I'm just not kind of saying like the traditional view on rest periods is that, you know, longer rests are better for, for muscle growth. And if they saying. are, okay. they shouldn't be the same. Yeah, I think a lot of people have just really taken this the soundbite that longer rest periods are better and just ran with it to eternity. But there's also kind of the cognitive dissonance when you see that people will say, "Oh, rest rest pause training or myo reps are can lead to to, to similar muscle growth." Um, and basically, Zach mentioned this webinar I did, and I was just trying to figure out like how can this be the case that these might offer like these are seemingly conflicting, right? So on one hand long rest periods, definitely better. Don't even question it. And then on the other hand, Hey, rest, pause, drop set. Those work too. Um, I want to be very clear. We don't know why that is the case, but we have some thoughts and this is just kind of a good format to discuss them. Um, and, and a point that Zach brought up that I've found pretty convincing is that, um, our hunch is that if you're training with lower, with shorter rest periods, it's going to increase your perceived effort of a given repetition, basically. So like if you're at a given, let's, let's say you knew exactly how close to failure you were, like just objectively, like you could actually know that even though there's no way we, we really can. But if you could actually know that, if you're taking shorter rest periods, you're going to have greater local muscular fatigue as well as some cardiorespiratory fatigue. That's going to influence your perception of effort. So you're going to think you're closer to failure than you actually were is basically our current thought process is that rest periods, shortening your rest periods is going to have a downstream effect on perception of effort. And because your perception effort is skewed, that's why longer rest periods might seem to be better um, in some cases. But in other cases, that perception of effort might not lead to a difference in hypertrophy outcomes when the muscle group you're training is smaller. Okay. So things like biceps, um, the local fatigue and the cardiorespiratory fatigue, just in absolute terms is going to be smaller, right? So thus the influence on perception of effort is going to be smaller. And thus that's why you can get similar gains. Again, I don't think this is bulletproof. I I'm not saying we have super good evidence for this, um, but I am saying there is a bit of a contradiction, at least to some degree in the research with this. Um, I think there's still a lot that, that we kind of need to investigate, but I think this is in a hypothesis worth considering when thinking about your training or just thinking about this concept in general. Um, so that's kind of the, the overall idea. Um, Jake, Zach, if you guys have anything to add or you want to poke holes in that, you can go for it. But one thing, the one thing I was going to say too, that like, I think it's important to keep in mind is that like, for example, on, on biceps, um, local fatigue and, and cardio, cardio respiratory fatigue will increase your perception of effort, but a certain amount of local fatigue is actually also going to increase the rate at which you're getting closer to failure. So I think it's, it's kind of a two-parter in that regard in which your perception of effort is going to increase, but you're also going to be kind of kickstarting the process of getting close to failure because of that local fatigue. So it's essentially the scenario in which that will lead to worse outcomes is when the additional local fatigue that, you know, kickstarts the process of you get into that kind of quote unquote effective zone of, of training from a proximity of failure standpoint is outweighed by the fact that uh, your perception of effort is just completely, um, you know, it's, it's, it's inaccurate. So like, the obvious example there is there's a very big difference between doing mile reps on curls and doing sets of 20 at a nine RP on squats. Think about the, the, the kind of the contrast of the slightly positive thing you're getting from the local fatigue for the next set 
versus the increase in perception of effort you get from that set and how that's kind of different between those two exercises. The squat is going to skyrocket in terms of uh, your, your perception of effort for the next set. And I'd be, <laughs> a lot of people aren't going to be able to get to a true nine RP on that next set, just because it's so, so difficult to do that when you have that much muscle mass um, kind of participating. Whereas the bicep curl, maybe that local fatigue actually is going to help you get to that um, kind of, kind of uh, quote unquote effective zone of training, uh, despite that slightly offset perception of effort. Now, I just want to echo what Josh said is like, we definitely don't know if this is even remotely feasible. Like there's some acute evidence. Eric Helms wrote a really, really good article kind of discussing this topic a little bit. And he pointed out some mechanistic evidence that maybe, you know, points to, to some degree that like MPS or something like that is harmed um, with shorter rest periods. I don't want to go into that a ton, but I think there, there's some, some indications that, um, Maybe that's not the best thing to look at in, in this example. And I just think the perception of effort thing seems to make a lot of sense uh, for me to me. Um, so I, I think that to me is kind of my mental working model at the moment, although I'm definitely open to changing my mind. And, and kind of the central fatigue is the other part of this that people often kind of discuss in this that I think we I don't even know when when we found it, but there was like a recent review paper that kind of questioned the the scientific methods underlying central fatigue. So that kind of has all of us slightly uncertain on the topic um, and, and kind of how you can measure it. And, and so like saying that shorter rest periods are gonna to lead to more central fatigue, which is a kind of a common sound bite. Um, very well, maybe true, I don't know, but um, it's just something uh, I, don't, I don't know if we can totally know with our current methods, but go ahead. Yeah, I have two things. First of all, the, the shout out to the, the 3DMJ blog that it's really like good. said. Dr. Helms wrote a, a blog about um, actually this exact topic, and he cited some stuff looking at the amount of muscle mass um, involved in that influencing the like proportion of central versus peripheral fatigue. And hey, perhaps greater muscle mass, uh, when there's greater muscle mass involved in the exercise, um, that's going to increase the central fatigue within the set. And that might be at play here as well. Um, that might be the case as well, but I actually think the central fatigue concept and the perception of effort thing that we're, we're bringing up are potentially two sides of the same co uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, like you said, this <laughs> fatigue stuff is really, really complicated, man. Um, but there actually might not be a way to differentiate between perception of effort and the central fatigue. Um, so it's tough, right? It could be a combination of the two. Um, so yeah, the, the second point is that this conversation reminds me of the carbohydrate mouth rinsing research um, and kind of briefly giving an overview of that body of research can inform how you think about this a little bit. So with the carbohydrate mouth rinsing research, if you look at um, the studies that show that when you mouth rinse carbohydrates, so just think like Gatorade or something, um, that will improve your ability to perform volume at a given load. Those are generally exercises that are more, um, more fatiguing, higher rep stuff, shorter reps periods, that kind of stuff. Those are generally the studies that see a benefit to carbohydrate mouth rinsing. And why would, why would just mouth rinsing carbohydrates improve your performance? Well, um, it's probably because of some sort of increase in reward pathways and potentially decreased central fatigue slash perception of effort type thing. Um, but the point is, is that mouth rinsing, uh, carbohydrate mouth rinsing does not seem to improve maximal strength performance. Why? Probably because there isn't that acute, um, that like acute local or cardiorespiratory fatigue for there to actually be any benefit to this reduction in central fatigue slash perception of effort. Um, so again, there's kind of this interplay of how much muscle mass are we using? How much fatigue are we accumulating, whether that's local muscular fatigue, um, and or cardiorespiratory fatigue, and how much is that influencing perception of effort? So it's all kind of intertwined. I'm not sure if our framing is totally accurate. Um, maybe we're not even onto something, but just, a an literally just a shot in the dark. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Um, Jake, you have any holes to poke in that, or I would want to think about it more. Um, <laughs> that's the only intelligent response that's been from the past yeah. ten minutes. 
<laughs> Man, it's it's so hard to because I mean, like you're saying, the fatigue stuff is so complicated and hard to measure and hard, like even in practice, it's like how do you describe how centrally fatigued you? You know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. just, um, it's it's. I don't know, man. It, it the. I personally have never really thought of those sort of like intensity techniques having a being better than traditional training. Like it's, um, I mean, you brought up the Pressy study, but like, I think of it honestly. I I use it in a way of like it's really the same. It, it's just it's just more. I, more I agree with that for more. sure. Uh, yeah. some people just enjoy it more pushing hard or whatever. And I think there's also the inherent benefit of you get more exposure to getting close to failure. So you know what that feels like potentially increases accuracy of proximity to failure ratings. Right. So um, I don't even know how we got here after the, the lower RPE rest time stuff, but like, whatever, <laughs> uh, here we are. Zach, Zach picked a question from our question. Oh, I, I'm going to ask it. I'm and asking he, it. I'm asking he it. completely he he asked what he wanted to ask so we could talk about but um no I think this is a super interesting topic um something I definitely want to keep you know reading other areas of research that might be relevant to to give us further insights um like Zach mentioned there's this paper kind of questioning the premise of central fatigue for resistance training that we found super interesting that um but man it's complicated it's super complicated and we're far from experts on that topic specifically so um that's it's it's probably best that this discussion was at the end of the podcast um because anybody that that is hanging around will understand that um at this point we're just kind of chatting about some thoughts we have and we we definitely are not claiming to have certainty about this topic um i think the last question here is is probably the most important one of the podcast um so it is what is the best ice cream flavor, and do you eat it out of a bowl or a cone? Yeah, go ahead, be wrong first. So, obviously Zach, if you bowl. say mint, if you if either you of you better not say mint, <laughs> is Zach gonna say mint? Go ahead. Hold on. Okay. Obviously, a bowl is better because you can fit more ice cream in it. That's not debatable. Although cones that. are delicious, you just gotta have more than one cone because we have to equate relative ice cream between. Um. So the bowl is definitely better. Best ice cream flavor. Anything with peanut butter in it is my thing. I'm a huge fan of taking like French vanilla ice cream and then putting peanut butter on top. That's the best way to do it, in my opinion. Um, Nice, man. Um, I have a feeling whatever Zach says, I'm not going to be able to speak after. So I'm going to give my answer. Then Zach's going to say his his answer. Then he's going to wrap up the podcast. Um, yeah, bowl, the bowl is definitely the, the way to go. Um, I just think that not having a spoon to eat ice cream is pretty miserable, <laughs> is really what it comes down to. Um, and just cones are kind of cheap. They're kind of bad. Just not that good. Um, Waffle cone is better than those weird styrofoam ones, though. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty obvious. Thanks, Jake. But um, <laughs> You're to help. But um, yeah, it's just not... The, the juice just, <laughs> the juice is not worth the squeeze. Um, and then I'm going to quickly wrap up here <laughs> and choose cookie dough. All right. So, you know, the first part of this question is that both of you guys clearly got tricked by the question in thinking that cones and bowls are mutually exclusive. They are not. Uh, I would be picking a waffle cone bowl, which is the obvious answer in this discussion. Um, you know, you're getting the benefits of both the taste of the cone, yet the carrying capacity of the bowl. That part's obvious. Now, uh, let's deliver my thesis on why mint is the best flavor of ice cream. Um, and so there's a few particular things we need to mention. Thank you for listening setting. to episode 17 <laughs> of the day. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's a few particular things about mint ice cream that are important. Um, number one, the highest quality uh, mint ice creams are actually the white version of of the the mint ice cream so the green lets you know that it's it's probably generally it's going to be more so like your kind of your great value brands i don't know who who is going to be familiar with that um the green they kind of try to walmart yeah well i mean i'm not saying it's bad i'll still eat it but it's kind of it's kind of to trick you um into thinking it's more exotic than it really is but if it's a you know a solid it looks like vanilla ice cream but it's 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 mint um you know other benefits are after you're eating it, you know, you feel very clean. 
Um, you had a nice treat, but you also don't really need to brush your teeth afterwards because you know what the ice cream did that for you. Um, it also combines some some crunchy aspects, you know, the chocolate chips within the ice cream. It isn't just always smooth. Um, you know, a lot of people that aren't uh, sociopaths will enjoy something crunchy on their desserts and, you know, the, the chocolate chips add that aspect. So, you know, for various reasons, um, I, I dominated this question and own both of you. So, um, so, so ahead, what you're saying is that you eat frozen toothpaste? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it, it, there seems to be an invalid premise there saying that that's bad. Uh, I mean, I think I think the root cause here is that Zach only goes on first dates, so he needs to worry about. <laughs> hey, I'll take whatever I can get. So, um, but yeah, with that, we will uh, close out episode 17 of the Dave Driven Strength Podcast. Thank you for for making it this far, um, and 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 working through this tomfoolery at the end here. But um, you can find links in the description below. We are looking for additional questions for for these Q and A. So please. Um, drop anything you'd like to know on the Q&A form um, linked in the description. Additionally, we have, of course, our individualized programming product um, that we're really excited about. We've made some additional additions to the program library, um, working up to, I think, 980 is where we're at right now and, and, and growing. Um, currently making modifications to that all the time. So if you're interested in kind of uh, getting what we think is as close to one-on-one -on -one coaching as possible at an affordable price, go ahead and click that link to find out more about that. But without further ado, we'll uh, go ahead and see you guys next time.